Welcome. I'm Joanne Law, Director of Mediation Institute, and I'm really delighted to have Emma May Litchfield and Danielle Hutchinson uh, from Resolution Resources here with us today. Uh, they're going to be uh, sharing some more information about the current review and um, also answering questions as we go through. Before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, peoples as the traditional custodians of Australia and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Gunai Kurunai people in um, East Gippsland. Now we are recording, so if that's a problem for anyone, just uh, feel free to turn off your, um, your video. And I will now hand over to um, Emma May and Danielle. Thanks, Joanne. Hi, everybody. Just yeah. to quickly introduce ourselves so you know where we are. <laughs> I'm Emma May and Danielle, if you could give a wave and a hello so everyone can see. Hi, you. Hi everyone. Nice to see you. But before we start, we'd just really like to thank um, Joanne for, or, and Mediation Institute for inviting us to present today um, and having and hosting this information session for us. Um, absolutely, we'll start with presenting some, some information to you just to orient you. But then we, we really do encourage everybody to participate in, in the conversation, ask questions, use the chat function, et cetera, and we'll, and we'll try and answer everything that we possibly can. Um, today. So it, before we start, also I'd just like to say, I can't see all your faces now, but when we could, it was lovely to see some familiar, familiar faces in the, in the crowd, those people who have already participated in part of the consultation process um, for the review, and we thank them for their participation. Also lovely to see both mediators and representatives from um, member organisations who are here today. So thank you everybody for coming along. Danielle? Um, well, thank you for, so <laughs> thanks for the wonderful introduction. I think probably um, maybe the first thing that we can just remind people of is that there is the NMAS Review Hub and MMA and I have tried really hard to make sure that the materials that we've used, the information on the approach, the methodology, you know, all of the resources that they are, um, they're available for people so that it, it is a transparent process. So um, for anybody that is not familiar, it's um, WW. I'll pop, it in, I'll pop it in the chat. Oh, okay, great. MMA, I'll pop it in the chat. And what we've also been doing is recently we've just uh, popped up there a section under Get Involved, which covers um, underneath that there is so I'm just actually going to pull up the tab so I can, <laughs> so I can see it, um, is, is some frequently asked questions. So NMAS review survey um, FAQs. And so what we've done is we've anticipated um, a number of questions that will come up. But as questions come in over, you know, um, throughout the process, we will add information there as well. So um, that's um, a good source of information. So we encourage people to um, have a look at that. And, and check out the, the resources that we've made there. And we've also published um, some reports, Sim may mention the participation that people had had early already. Um, so in terms of the effectiveness survey, and that was a first part of our consultation. Um, and those reports, uh, the first two reports are there as is, I think the, is the third one live yet, Emma May? It's coming. It's coming. Very soon, very soon. I think that I think um, MSB has been putting out little teasers about some of the things that we found out, and probably the key thing is that with some of the things we found out through the survey review, our effectiveness survey, we were able to make sure that we included um, information that would help us make sense of people's responses uh, to this particular part of the survey but also capture some of the emerging themes and questions that had come up um, in relation to mediator practice. Uh, so, um, so that's a really important area. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, MMA? Yeah, I suppose we have, again, a lot of familiar faces in the room, but there may be some of you who are first timers, so to speak, and may not have even known that there was a review of the NMAS happening. 
So it has been happening um, happening for a while now, um, COVID restricted, <laughs> um, but it, 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 is, it, has, it has been a long and consultative process so far. And this final part of the, uh, final part of the review is the NMAS review, so, sorry, this final part of, the, of our consultation with the DR community is taking place in the NMAS review survey. So even if you haven't been part of the consultation process so far, this is your chance to have your say where your voice will, will help us help inform the recommendations that we make to the Mediator Standards Board coming out of this review. Right. So, um, I'm just wondering, we've, I've got a visual here just to show um, this, just the stages. So just in terms of the process so that people can see, obviously some people are, are visual. So we started off with some reference groups and they were drawn from a whole range of places. Plus we also invited um, MSBs, uh, MSB member orgs, so RMABs, training organisations, to nominate representatives. Um, and we also had people from uh, people that aren't currently MSB uh, member organisations. And the reason for that is because we wanted to make sure that we captured the ideas of people that have that for either have either chosen not to come into that tent or at this stage aren't in that tent because um, they're not necessarily involved in um, traditional mediation. They might be involved in family dispute resolution and con or conciliation. And that is something that the MSB had asked us to consider was the relationship of those different types um, to the en masse and how, whether or not they, they fit together. So we had those reference groups. From them, we drew out um, a lot of the common issues. We had uh, a series of workshops where we picked the experts' brains about their practice. Because that's the thing, really, um, what defines the differences between uh, different types of processes is, is the way often that the mediators practice. However, we also know that practice evolves over time and it chip, you know, shifts and changes. So we needed to learn about that. So then we developed our survey from there, had the pilot, a few people helped us out with that. Thank you to the volunteers if you are one of those people. And now we have the NMAS survey. And so the NMAS survey, this is the sort of idea of capturing big, big, big data, uh, big information. And um, we use a specific methodology that is um, specific to the development of professional standards. So it's, it's targeted in that way. And what we're able to do is to have a look at how different types of practitioners practice and see where things are similar or different. And so that's why we want to consult so many people and we want so many different perspectives um, so that we can really find the boundaries where things overlap so that we can really get down to what are the essential features um, in terms of um, mediator practice and what's required for mediator standards. Do you want to add anything, MMA? Yeah, I suppose it's one of the, the frequently asked questions from people who have, who have participated in the survey that they have seen that there are questions in there that seem to go beyond facilitative mediation. Why am I being asked these questions if I am a, you know, an en masse accredited facilitative mediator? And that is the reason why we've been asked to look beyond the scope. Just to make that very clear, that does not mean that we are wiping out facilitative mediation. <laughs> rather, rather, it means we're seeing whether other practices might be included. For example, for those of you who are conciliators in the room, um, and just to refer to ADRAC's conciliation paper that has come out, one of the things that was suggested in their paper is that conciliators may want their own equivalent to the National Mediator Accreditation System and National Conciliator Accreditation System. The way that we're collecting the data and the way that we're going to review it, we'll be able to see whether or not it's appropriate and make a recommendation thus, but to, to see whether or not it's appropriate, can we actually include things, uh, uh, pract practitioners like FDRPs or conciliators into the NMAS? Are there similarities with practice or are they so distinctly different that it, that it wouldn't, be an, wouldn't be appropriate? Um, or are there other, other, other things that we might, might want to consider? So I just want to reassure the facilitative mediators in the room <laughs> that we are not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. 
rather it's very important that we're that we're able to consider these things and all of that aside you know for the data nerds like Danielle and I in the room and the academics in the room you know what an amazing opportunity to be able to collect such a and compare you know there's a, there, there will be enough we were having a conversation Danielle yesterday weren't, weren't we there will be enough data from collected from this review that we could spend a whole lifetime analyzing it so <laughs> so there is there's so much potential for us um, to be able to to be able to use the data and, and analyze it in different ways. So as Joanne had said in the chat function, please, you can pop questions in at any time. We could talk underwater and we wanna make sure <laughs> that we're actually answering questions or orienting you in a way that's actually useful. So if we say something that doesn't make sense or needs clarification, etc., there'll be others in the room who feel the same. So please let us know. You will all know from experience when you are deeply ingrained in something, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. So please let us know if there's anything else that you want to know. Mm -hmm. So Danielle, are you just going to orient people in terms of the methodology here? Is that yeah, if, if that's right, we'll just take a moment because I know there's some people, they're sort of thinking, you know, I'm providing all of this information. You're asking me all these questions, like what, what has this got to do with anything? So I just wanted to... Um, orient people a little bit uh, and maybe we maybe this is something we attach in the FAQs MMA is the Australian uh, professional standard for principles and the leadership profiles um, this was a project um, that um, I worked on previously and we the, the standards that we developed and we're using exactly the same methodology and so if you want to see what it pretend, what this what sort of is produced um, that's the kind of thing that does get produced we're not saying that that's what will happen for um, the, for, it won't look exactly the same because there's a slightly different purpose, but in terms of the kinds of ways that you look at standards, practice, how it works, this sort of gives you a sense of, of what it ends up looking like. Mm -hmm. um, and we also used a similar methodology when we did our work on the GPC, which is, you know, for anybody that's familiar with that. So I just want to um give a warning to people i'm about to flash up a graph and some people as soon as the graph comes up they they're gonna you know um glaze over i'm not going to go through all of the detail of the graph this is just more of a visual representation you won't be able to read everything because it's the kind of thing you need a big screen for but i just wanted to to provide a visual so you get a sense of what it looks like so what happens is when we work with big data in this way we end up with a map that looks um, a bit like this. And so what you can see is you've sort of got this um, distribution curve. And so all the little bits on the, what side is that? That's the left-hand side. All the bits on the, I don't know, hopefully, <laughs> all the little crosses on there, they're people that answered a survey, a series of questions, just like the ones that we've presented. There's a specific way we get people to answer questions because it allows us to produce something like this. On the right hand side, there are some numbers and they're the numbers for the questions. And because of the way that um, statist the statistical process works, what we're able to do is we're able to have a look at the distribution or the patterns of how people answered each of the questions. And what it does is it allows us to see where different groups of questions or different responses, where they gather together and where different groups of people gather together. So what we can actually do is we can create a scale from, you know, sort of graduate level practice all the way up to the expert. And we can work out which responses are typical of an expert, what responses are typical of a new grad. Um, and that allows us to work out if all the grads are answering something that seems to be sort of halfway up the line, what that can let us know is actually maybe the benchmark we have for grads is too low. So it means that we can shift and change. Maybe sometimes we can find out that if all the grads are answering at these really sort of the very lowest levels of questions and we've sent our benchmark up here, we can go, oh, maybe we've set the benchmark too high. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we use the big data. It seems extraordinary and mind-blowing that we can actually create a scale of knowledge, skills or mindsets and then match a person 
to the point of where they sit on that scale based on their answers. So it's essentially the principles that sit behind robust assessment. And, and, and that's where all of this is drawn. So it does link into the training and assessment, which, which people have um, asked some questions about. So um, I, I haven't got the chat up, but I just want to check because I'm not going to go into any more detail, but does anybody have anything that they want to ask about that? Maybe if you can have a look at the there, chat. There, there are some practical questions that are coming up and it's not really about um, this data so far, but I, okay. did wanna, I did want to add something just to... You know, again, for those people like, what is this gobbledygook that you're talking about? <laughs> Let me put this in practical terms for everyone. I suppose the thing we want you to know about this survey is the NMAS review, the current NMAS review may look different from other reviews, not only NMAS reviews, but also other reviews that have happened in terms of standards, because you know, often we're lucky enough to get a group of experts in a room who will discuss and think about things in a particular way, and that's very important work. However, this is distinctly different from that because it is an evidence-based approach that uses a methodology that allows us consult to consult further. And, you know, for example, so far we've sent out the survey to 6,000 people, <laughs> and prior to that, 700 people have been involved in consultation so far. And the responses that we'll get from that will actually be able to, you know, we, we, we have no agenda. We're asking the questions and you are going to tell us what the answers are. So, you know, the, I suppose the distinction between, you know, bear with us while we explain some of the, some of the technical things, you know, around this. But I think what we really want you to know is um, just because it's a survey and yes, a survey is a survey, it's not a survey. And mm -hmm. this is actually going to help us and is part of a consultation process. So again, it seems like it's kind of flipped around because often these reviews happen and then the consultation happens afterwards. The way this methodology works and the way that we've been working so far is we're actually consulting before we actually make the recommendations. So it's... so make it's, the survey. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so <laughs> you could do the survey, which means that it will be robust and evidence-based by the time we make those recommendations. So mm -hmm. I suppose that's what we want to know out of it. So um, I think, and I'm going to talk through, talk a little bit about this. Don't worry about the technical jargon because I think the thing that we want to bring in, I'm going to take us to like, some questions that came up and some things that we're finding out. I might, I, you know, we might just briefly go through all this because I feel like there are questions that are coming up. Absolutely. I'm going to link it to careers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, if we have a look at this, we can see on one side, we've got this idea of item I, latent trait, two people, and then you've got on the other side, you know, we can see that there's a shift in the balance, right? So one of the things that we started when we were doing the effectiveness survey, we asked the questions, but then we also made sure that people identified certain information. Because one of the things that came through when we were talking about it is like, oh, this group of people thinks the standards work for them, but other groups of people don't think the standards work. So, for example, just out of the example, you know, people say, oh, but our area of practice is so different then those parts of the standards don't apply to us. So one of the reasons why we ask all the background information is that it means that we can then analyse things according to different groups and see whether or not that changes what people think about it. So, for example, when we were asking about in mass effectiveness, one of the things we wanted to make sure was that the people that were answering the survey, we could tell the difference between the people that had, you know, that this is their bread and butter, they do it all the time, and the people who dabble in it a little bit um, but aren't really at the coalface. So we wanted to be able to pull out and say, you know, if the people at the coal face are saying it's not effective, but the people that are dabbling in it saying, oh, that's great, then actually, the, you know, the people that are dealing with it, working with it all the time, we probably need to really, you know, we might need to prioritise their needs because they're the ones that have to live it day in, day out. So it might look at, we might be able to then say, hey, look, for the person that's the hobbyist, it's fine, but the person that does it day in and day out, it doesn't work. This is how we need to make the changes. So what that started to bring out for us is we started to learn about who was getting what work. 
so that, you know, there were large groups of practitioners that were, they were the ones that were typically employed or or typically working. 100% of their work was in dispute resolution where there were others that were getting, you know, unlikely to get, you know, a mediation once a month. So that was sort of, that's where some of this background information, we sort out, we can sort out responses based on those sorts of different things. But what that's led us to is in this new survey is to start to be able to say, all right, let's look at whether or not, for example, when uh, we're looking at the standards and we say, well, how many mediations are people saying they're getting a month? And then if we find out there's a massive group of people, maybe graduates, who are getting less than uh, one mediation a month, but then there are requirements in terms of the numbers of mediations, but, and then we also ask the trainers or RMABs, well, how many mediations do you expect people to be able to get? We can start to see if things like the number of expected mediations that a person needs to um, conduct each year um, is realistic in the context of what we know people are actually doing. So that's why we ask the background information so we can line up the practicalities with the set of standards. So that's that's basically what that, that thing is. It's like, are the responses different? And what impact does that have on how we need to structure things? Yep. Great. <laughs> so hopefully that's oriented everyone. I can see that there are some questions quite a few questions um, starting to come through. Yep. Joanne, keep an eye on us because otherwise, you know, we, sometimes we need to be reined in. <laughs> but I think what I'll do is I'll start at the top. If people actually want to, um, you know, ask, um, there, there are 40 of us in the room at the moment, so obviously it can't be a free-for-all. But if people do want to ask questions, and if it is your specific question, feel free to, you know, un- unmute if we haven't if we haven't answered it. Um, I think that might be the way to go or if I... Have I spoken to, yeah, is that all right, Joanne? That, that's worked? Great. Okay. So I might just start at the top. Okay. And again, if I miss anything, please let me know, Joanne. So um, Emma has asked, hi, Emma, practical question. It takes one and a half uh, hours. Uh, if I start, will it save my responses if I need to take a break? The first thing I want to say about the length of the survey, we understand a survey of this kind is cognitively demanding. And it does take a long time and it does, you know, grab yourself a cup of tea, maybe your doona and sit in a quiet place. (laughs) And afterwards, you're probably going to want to kill us. (laughs) However, you can understand why we need it to be. And we didn't want to miss this opportunity to ask all the amazing questions. So, you know, imagine if we if we miss one out. So we do thank you in advance for taking the time to do it when we know it is demanding. But we know that you're up for the task. So, you know, for those for those people who are who are you know, starting the survey, we have discovered that there are a couple of glitches that we are fixing in the background. We thank you for your patience. If you're like, oh, I haven't got the time for it yet, and if there are glitches, just wait a couple of days and everything will be ironed out by then. Uh, but Emma's question, back to Emma's question. <laughs> the practical question is it takes an hour and a half. That's for people who want to complete both um, parts A and part B. We ask that everybody complete uh, part, part, uh, sorry, part one and part two. We ask that everybody complete part one because it is about standards, our practices as mediators, skills, knowledge, professional development and ethical responsibilities. And those people who want to participate in part two, which is half an hour, that will be more about the system itself, um, responsibilities of uh, RMABs, the MSB itself, um, complaints, etc. cetera. Um, we do realise that, you know, that idea of, do, does it, if we need to take a break, can I walk away from my computer? As wonderful as Survey Monkey is, <laughs> um, you know, it, it does, uh, it, it also has limitations. So for the people who have done it so far, um, at the feedback has been that it stayed open. They were worried it would close, but it hasn't closed for them. But we cannot, yeah, yeah but we it cannot. Does, it is, it is, it does stay open. So you can go in, we've got it set so that you can go back in and you can actually change your responses right up until the moment that it closes. So you've got the capacity to go back in and back out. You just need to make sure that you, you know, how you entered in um, is, 
you go back in and, and yep. exit. And it will log those ones that, you, you know, keep those ones that you've already done so you won't need to redo them. So I think yep. that answers the question that yeah. somebody else had asked later on. So yeah. yes, if you need to take a break, absolutely get your second cup of tea. <laughs> do all those kind of things. You can be reassured that Survey Monkey can hold that and we've set it up in the, in the way. Hope that answers that question, Emma. Um, the jump, Linda had asked GPC. The GPC was uh, was the global pound conference that happened in 2016, 2017. There'll be some people in the room who might have gone to the conference um, in Sydney. Basically, it was something that um, we had a significant uh, input in, in the design and the analysis of the questions that were asked, but it was a group of questions that were, were asked and taken around to 27 different countries in the world. Again, a huge data collection um, process, and from that, um, analysis and, and recommendations were made about the dispute resolution industry. I'll put up a link later on for the people who are, who are interested. For those, oh, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Emma's second practical question. Love it, Emma. Uh, should I read anything before I um, beforehand to start thinking about the topics? Um, you don't. What we're asking you is about your practice. So that's about your experience, your actual practice, not what you think you should be doing not what you could be doing given a couple of years, but what you're actually currently doing now. So you are, you are the, the expert in that. <laughs> so you don't need to read anything. If you are interested, uh, you know, and we've, we've given you a lot of information today. If you are interested in learning more about it before you, before you give it a crack, then absolutely follow, um, follow the link that I've put into the FAQs in the NMAS hub. And hopefully your questions will be answered there. Things like, why am I being asked questions beyond facilitative mediation? How might I answer the questions? Um, you know, what is the methodology? And we've added some resources for those who are interested, things like that. So information, I hope that, um, oh yeah. Dan. Yeah, I was gonna say possibly for part two, which is more about the system. Hmm. If, you, if you've got, um, because there are opportunities in there for people to talk about some of the things that, are, you know, about the system. So say for example, there's a, mix, there's a mixture of multiple choice and open text opportunities in part two. But like, for example, we've got some questions about the level of oversight that the MSB has over, say, for example, training. So if you don't, if you, we've, we've asked it in a way though, that um, we're not just want to, we're not just saying, you know, are you happy with it or what level of oversight do you think they should have? We're actually saying, what do you think the current level of oversight is and what do you think it needs to be? Because part of the feedback we can then give is we can say, hey, the whole community thinks that you're, or did we say to the MSB, the whole community thinks there's way less oversight than there actually is or the whole community thinks there's way more oversight. So asking people, are you happy with this? Sometimes that's not necessarily the question to ask because it might be that they, there's a lack of clarity about the, the expectations and the reality might be mismatched. So, so you're asked, so you can give your honest feedback in, in that regard. But at the same time, if there's something specific to the system, um, and we say, you know, what do you, what do you think about, um, you know, are there any, is there anything that you'd like to raise in terms of, say, the um, approval standards? Um, or in relation to RMABs or member organisations, um, if you've got something that you specifically want to say, that might be useful for you to have, you know, be familiar with the NMAS. If, um, but, you know, if you're not familiar with it and you don't care about it, then you probably won't be doing part two anyway. Yeah, so, I, so long, short answer to that long question <laughs> is if you wanted to, you could re-familiarise yourself with the NMAS and I'll put a link in there. Mm. Um, yeah, well, but, but completely not necessarily not necessary for part one because we will have people who aren't NMAS trained answering part one. Yeah. So it's designed for you to tell us what is it you know in terms of types of knowledge you have, how you how the level of skill you have in terms of when you practice, mm. and um, also attitudes or thoughts that you have about CPD, professional development, as well as um, certain ethics. And it's your opportunity, you know, if there are certain things that are included in the current in in the current um, 
say, for example, ethical requirements or expectations, we've got opportunities for you to say, look, I do it, but I think it's a load of rubbish. But then, or, or, or I do it and I advocate for it because I think it's fantastic. Mm. <laughs> yeah. so, so maybe that's one of, the, one of the things we can also do is the patterns that we've got in there, they are based on long established research into skill acquisition, the way that people's attitudes develop and change the different shifts. So um, we also, Emma and I were sort of talking about it. One of the things we can also do for the nerds out there is that we can link to a journal article or something like that so that people can see why we've chosen to use some of the language that we have. So it's deliberate. All of the language, you think, well, it's all deliberate um, to, to sort of differentiate between the way that some per one person's doing it and another person's doing it. Or So if you, you know, for example, read a level and you go, well, oh, that's in there, but oh, it could be that, it could be that. If there's something they go, yeah, but now you've made me go to the next level. That's the point. The point is, is that the questions are designed to force you to into the right spot so that you'll pick the right spot. So they're, they're sort of, um, they're designed to be helpful in, in that way. Can I, can I maybe just put that a bit more succinctly? So the idea is in the, in when you're answering the questions, if you can do the first level, then you can go on to the next level because the next level presumes that you can also do the first level so it is so it is cumulative in that way so mm -hmm. if you have reached the if you ironically this is going to sound counterintuitive if you have reached the highest level which is actually the bottom option it means that you can also do those other things that that go before it mm. so yeah so that answers yeah. that so i just might go on to um practical questions because we're because yeah. we're going into our research realm again danielle which is yeah. Sorry. You, yeah. you and i talking on it <laughs> Talking in Riz Riz. Okay, so, um, and Donia, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, with Parenting Orders Program Catholic Care Victoria, we work collaboratively with our FDRP using co me t co mediation and therapy. This works very well. I hope that you're referring to the fact that we're considering other processes um, in there. And we do invite you to, you know, in, invite those people who may not be the NMAS mediators to also fill in the survey if they are working with NMAS mediators. Um, in terms of um, the MSB member orgs who are in the room and also people who might be interested in NMAS but not necessarily an NMAS accredited mediator, we will be, uh, the survey will be open to everybody. You will be asked to indicate what, in what capacity or what hat you're wearing to fill in, to fill in the survey. And for those people who are anticipating it and haven't received it yet, including MSB mem member orgs, because we had found some glitches, we just want to ensure that all of those are ironed out before we send out a mass email. So mm -hmm. thank you for your patience, but it will be sent to you um, by today, tomorrow at the latest. Mm -hmm. And that will also include a link that we can send. So, so at, at this stage, as we've said, 6,000 people have been sent the email, <laughs> have been sent. So, you know, a lot of people... Are, and we would prefer, for, again, for us to be able to capture the data, that those people use the link in their email. But for those people who can't find the email because it's dropped into their junk, or, you know, as jo Joanne can testify, I lost her email this morning. <laughs> you know, if, if stuff happens and you can't find the link, we, we, we will provide another link on the NMAS hub for you to go in to, to go in that way. So, again, it's going to be open until the 28th, so you still have time. You haven't missed out. We love the fact that people want to get on board, even though it's only open um, yesterday, but um, bear with us. And then once that link is sent out, we rely on people like the 39 of you in this room today to spread the word because, yes, we have a network, but it's limited. We're lovely, you know, the, the Mediation Institute, thank you, Joanne, who has, you know, sent out her um, feelers, has meant that 40 people have now come to this event etc 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 so we need to get the furthest reach we need all the voices that we can possibly get and we need your we need you to be our champions mm. <laughs> um i think i just want to clarify um something there that we have sent the email to um the almost six thousand people that are connected to, through via um in mass accreditation so people that are or have been Mm. NMAS accredited have this access to the survey now mm. um so they've that's that's gone out we will um 
uh, for and and some RMABs will will vi you know vicariously have access to, uh, potential for access there. We're sending it out. Uh, we're, we're sending out a separate email formally to um, the RMABs and the training orgs. And then in terms of anybody that's not connected to the NMAS accreditation system, um, we're just going to have a, a, um, a like a, an embedded survey on the website. We will also send something out to our subscriber list um, to say, hey, um, can you can you fill it out? Um, but you know that that link that will be available in terms of embedded on the server, and maybe we can even put we can put a um, something in Twitter or, or, or whatever. But we, 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 our preference is for NMAS accredited people to complete it via their their email, and that's because we can track response rates and we can say this proportion of people filled it out. So that's that's ideal for us. But there is the opportunity to um, to access More it from the website. So, <laughs> yeah, so there's going to be lots of ways. Yeah, great. Um, third practical question from Emma. Thank you, Emma, for, for um, participating. Um, if I change my mind about an answer, can I go and further thinking? Can I go back? I hope that we've answered that question. You certainly can, and it will have still captured the questions that you, that you have put if you go forward again. Um, Elizabeth, did you send it to people who were uh, not nationally accredited mediators? I hope that we have answered that question there, um, but uh, not yet. And once the link is out, we hope that you will send it to the, the people that you think are important to include in the survey. Mm, um, yeah. Obviously, we can't send it out to every single Australian. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know them all. We've yeah. tried. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Um, Philip. Hi, Philip. Um, a 90-minute survey is a big ask. It is. Um, and thank you again for your participation. Sounds like a task for Easter long weekend. Yes, with a cup of tea and maybe a glass of wine and the other. No, you'll need all your you'll need all your senses. So <laughs> you know, celebrate with a glass of wine afterwards. <laughs> um, and I think I think I want to say probably you know we have in terms of uh, the biggest ask the biggest ask we have made is of people who have done NMAS training or are NMAS accredited. Um, because if they want to do part one and part two that's the full the full program mm. but there are certain things people that aren't like organizations we're not asking them necessarily um about the the, the way that say certain ethics questions are structured because um that's about how people feel about it and what they choose to do and their attitude towards something if you're an organization and there's an ethics requirement you can't make people love being ethical. You can only be happy with them complying. Do you know what I mean? It's not, you can't say, oh, we need everybody to be advocates. That's not, that's not how sort of that um, process works. So it actually means that the big ask is for MS accredited and trained mediators. Other people, it's slightly shorter. Yes. Um, there, there are parts, there are parts that um, aren't required. And that's part of the reasons why it's a little bit complex because the questions are slightly different uh, for people depending on whether or not they are NMAS accredited or connected to the NMAS in some way. Although you won't see that, that's just our hard work. No. That's just our hard work having to create yeah. five <laughs> let, that's me, let, let, me, let me put out then times for you. For those people who are participating only in um, part one, which is NMAS mediators, either accred accredited or not accredited mediators, uh, uh, etc it'll be one hour of your time for those people who choose to, for those individuals who choose to complete one part one and two it will be one and a half hours for for mediator msb member organizations it'll be shorter part one will be about 40 minutes and part two will be half an hour so all up it'll be oh gosh is that an hour and 20 minutes i have to do the maths on the spot so it's so, you know, it, it is all proportionate and it shouldn't be more than an hour and a half if you could choose to complete the whole, yeah. the whole lot. And just, just to assure people, we had, we, we had someone actually go through um, who was not entirely familiar with the survey and, and do it and time it. Mm -hmm. And that person finished on the dot of the, for part one, on the hour. Mm -hmm. I think it was like one hour and 46 seconds. Mm -hmm. So we've timed it, but, you know, and some people will finish it faster some people will finish it slower because they really want to deliberate. But we, we want to let you know that um, that that one hour, you know, that was what was based on having someone actually um, test that. 
Yeah, yeah. So Philip, I, I, I didn't want to dismiss your, your question and I might just actually quickly go back to it in terms of, I know it sounds like a task for the Easter long weekend. I do want to be mindful to everybody that because of the, um, again, you know, because of impacts of COVID and also uh, understandably the MSB having, requiring a certain timeline for these recommended recommendations to be made. Unfortunately, we can only hold the survey open until the 28th of February. Otherwise, we will not be able to get the work done to form those recommendations. So although we'd like to be able to extend it for you know, a month so that we can capture everybody, unfortunately, that is, that is the time um, period. In our experience with, uh, with bringing out surveys, and we've done a couple, <laughs> including the Global Pound Conference, most people who are going to participate, participate in the first week. So, you know, that, and that would be, that would be your experience too, Joanne, I'm sure in terms of, in terms of the surveys that you've done. So we will get cracking on all those links and we will, you know, again, uh, Danielle uh, referred to being a, a subscriber. She was speaking about being a subscriber to the NMAS hub. So if you go into the NMAS hub and you want news and updates and links and all those kind of things from us, then you go into the NMAS hub and you can subscribe and we'll, and we'll send you that. Otherwise, just visit. Okay, um, just mindful that we only have 15 minutes left. Jabber, 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 sorry. Um, Linda, noting that First Nations people communication, interpret and have different values, what authoritative accommodation, if any, is made for cultural principle practice for First Nations decision-making and conflict resolution? Now, there is a long answer to this, to this question. But as part of the, the NMAS review, we were also asked to, um, to consider where there was appetite, whether or not there was appetite from the, the First Nations community to be, um, to be included in the, in the NMAS review. Um, anybody, including um, any cold LGBTQI, any diversity, diverse groups, everybody was welcome to be included, including First Nations people in the in the NMAS that's been going along. However, we also have a reference group that is specifically for First Nations um, communities, because again, making sure that we are asking community whether or not they have an appetite for it, <laughs> rather than saying, here's the NMAS review and you have to be involved, takes a long time because it deserves respect and also we need to see whether or not the, the, the community are, are interested rather than imposing that on them. So um, just quick, just briefly, Danielle, is there anything else that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, um, I think also to, we, you know, we have worked um, specifically with a couple of groups. Um, we've got, we had um, our First Nations stakeholder um, engagement person develop um, some recommendations around that in terms of proper consultation and how we um, suggest that um, you know having a having a third party intermediary is 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 potentially not not um, not ideal and and some ideas that they might have but but one of the other things that we've done too is we we do have some opportunities to describe or accommodate different types of specialization in practice and that's something that we're we're also looking at in terms of recommendations so um, what that means is hopefully we will um, be able to make recommendations about how to accommodate some of those different types of things um, but again you know the questions are not all necessarily set out with facilitative mediation in mind, in mind. that is the reference point the current standards is the anchor for it but we, we've tried to um, create opportunities for um, people to be able to indicate different values or attitudes or practices. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Danielle. Um, Cheryl has said, COVID has had a major impact on a number of mediations as people have stayed put in unhappy marriages, et cetera, I'm sure in businesses, et cetera, um, during COVID for the last two years, which affects our recertification assessment. Yes, COVID has definitely impacted us in in many ways, and um, and that will that will be part of the you know the things that need to be considered. And I'm sure that the MSB will be taking that in mind in terms of um, consideration of the recommendations and making sure that they can consult with people. Um, in terms of recertification, 
Again, I can't speak on their behalf, but you may wish to um, communicate with your um, recognised member accreditation body, the people that you got your accreditation through, because they might have their own um, they might have their own thinking around or, or accommodations around around doing that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have as much influence as that. <laughs> so, so I hope that um, that you that you can speak to them. Um, Good oh, you got a you got a thumbs up, Danielle, for your explanation. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and Danya, I'm an accredited mediator working um, in the POP as the team leader and family counsellor. Oh, thank you for the introduction. I'm not sure what the question was. <laughs> um, uh, Joanne, just reiterating that she's recording this um, for, for people extended beyond today. Um, Danielle and MMA, are you fine with the participants sharing the link or making it public? Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. You know, part of the, our thinking is we want this to be as transparent. We want all, and we want to, you know, open the curtain. <laughs> so again, you know, with, with your permission and everybody's in the room permission, we'll also put a link to it on the NMAS hub, because I think it's an important opportunity for us to have, have answered any of the questions. If anybody has um, any, any, any issues with, with that, speak now forever, hold your peace, but, you know, really absolutely happy to share information. Okay, Carol. Um, it took us years for standards to be developed and accepted. One hour, 20 minutes is not long from that perspective. Thanks, Carol, <laughs> champion. <laughs> we really appreciate that. And, you know, while we're talking, it did take a long time for these standards and a lot of consideration. And then we, we also want, you know, for people who might have been part of the reviews in, in the first, in the first you know, previous reviews and also the developments of standards in the first place, we are very aware and acknowledge that we are standing on the shoulders of giants here and we do not want to throw out any information that you know that that is still relevant that is still current that is still important we have been asked to review the current standards and that doesn't mean that we're that we're taking them and throwing them out we're mm. actually using them to inform recommendations it's another one of the reasons why this survey is so long is i was just thinking that yeah <laughs> Because we had to, you know, for those people who conceptualise in this way, we had to map out all the questions that we had asked. We mapped them against the, the existing standards to make sure that we didn't leave anything out. So, you know, again, when, you, when you're considering it, think like, be like Carol <laughs> and say, you know, it's an hour and 20 out of, my, out of my day, but I am contributing in a way that it hasn't been possible before to this tour, tour review of this kind. Yeah. Not yeah. only is it the first time that something like this has been done in the DR community in Australia, internationally, we have a we have a chance to put a stamp on this is how we do things in Oz. <laughs> so so hopefully people will um, get on board. Okay. Tracy, does the survey look at the quality standards of training between different trainers? I have experienced two different RTOs who delivered and assessed in vastly different ways. So absolutely in terms of part two of the survey. Um, in fact, Danielle, I'll get you to address this question. You'll do it. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we've asked about in that regard is um, in relation to oversight and how they what sort of accountability there is. We also, through the reference groups and workshops, have already gathered some information um, about areas that may or may not, you know, that may be problematic. And so we've been working on that as well. Um, we're looking at um, how the NMAS interacts with other things as well to see the, 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 the flow and effects if there is inconsistency in quality. And the key thing that we've gone back to is the current standards where it talks about the MSB having an obligation mm -hmm. to um, oversee certain things in order to protect the public and ensure quality and all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've put a few questions in there in relation to a whole, a whole host of things um, to reflect back on how that might relate to that obligation. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we've captured that. You'll notice though in part two, and we have to be really clear on this, we've, we've made the spaces for people to write stuff relatively small, not, not, not like 25 words or less, but they're not massive because we don't want people to go on a long diatribe for 15 pages about all the problems. What you'll see is when we've asked for input, usually what we've done is we've either said, with this usually it's sort of two ways we've framed it it's either 
the there's always a few questions and it's that's in keeping with the methodology that we've got in part one so we want people to start thinking about how things look at different sort of levels of quality so what we say for example we might say what's it like currently describe what you think it's like currently then what are the minimum things that would be required to make it fit for purpose and then we say all right now that you've got that what would it look like if you had a magic wand if it was aspirational and so we're asking people to not think, oh, good, better, best, you know, it's good accreditation, it's better accreditation, it's great accreditation, because that's not helpful because one person's good is another person's best is whatever. So that's what hopefully through going through part one, you've sort of got practised at the idea that there are different types of verbs that indicate how complex, you, you know, how, how sophisticated you are in terms of how you engage with something. So we want you to sort of try and describe that. The other thing that we've done is we've also asked, okay, what would be the short-term goals, medium-term goals and long-term goals in terms of, you know, if it's seven years plus, this is what we would hope ideally, this would be the ideal situation, you know, and this is what progress would look like on the way. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it can be really easy to just, just describe everything in, in a utopian sense. And then when we don't get there, feel like we haven't achieved anything. So the idea, again, this is all because it's based on this notion of standards, development of whatever it is. It's like, okay, we can create something that will allow us to look at, all right, what do we need as a minimum, but also where are we headed and how will we tell how we're going in terms of steps along the way? So it's essentially, you know, it's, it's, it's the whole thing's in, embedded in, um, principles for uh, developing standards, measuring progress, assessment, evaluation. Um, and so we've asked you to contribute this and we know it works because that's what we did with um, the GPC. So we asked thousands of people to answer like that um, and it allowed us to get, um, and we, you know, we were able to create reports for seven locations in America that gave them a blueprint for their dispute resolution community for the next 20 years. So um, it's a it's a really effective way to do it rather than just say, you know, please tell us in 4,000 words all the problems that they are. That's not um, as helpful in, in, in the type of process that we're doing. Yeah, so not a written submission, but actually specific questions so that we can bring you and we can use your information. Mm -hmm. Now, Joanne, I am mindful that we have four minutes. We are happy to stay because I can see there are 11 more questions to go. We are happy to stay, but, but we are very aware that an hour out of everybody's day is a big ask. So what, yeah. how would you like to proceed? Um, look, I, I think people might, can leave if you, if you need to, <laughs> uh, but we can, we're recording. So um, yeah. that way the questions can get answered. I think yeah, fantastic. We're, 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 we're really available. And for those people who do have to pop off, we really thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank we you. hope that we have been able to answer the questions in a way that, you know, that helps you encourage others to participate. Um, and, and we really appreciate it. Okay, Sue. Oh, hello, Sue. Great to see you too. <laughs> You've described a fabulous, comprehensive and inclusive approach. I will take that feedback. <laughs> You're doing great work. If it doesn't kill us, Sue. <laughs> but um, great. Okay. Um, Joanne, RMABs do have permission from the MSB to look at considerations regarding practice hours due to COVID. But if you haven't done a number of mediation cases, that may be an en masse reassessment um, to make sure that you're still competent. Thanks, Joanne. That's helpful. From, from, the, from an MSB member or themselves. Thanks. Um, Sue, thank you both for the comprehensive. Oh, 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 you've come up again. It was such good feedback. Okay. <laughs> um, great. Um, Alan. You're both contributing amazingly. Thank you so much for your for your feedback. We love it because <laughs> um, you know in, to, for for two for two women sitting. You know, ironically, Danielle and I live five hundred meters away from each other, but we haven't been work, <laughs> been able to work together in Victoria for the last two years. So we virtually, mm -hmm. but for two of us, basically sitting in our virtual room, sometimes it's it's hard for us to gauge. You know, this yeah. This, going to be sent out to 10,000 people. Are they going to think that we've got <laughs> worms in our head or yeah. are they going to see the, the, the value that we see in it as well? So thank you so much. Um, 
As, uh, Joanne, as a training provider, um, Mediation Institute is definitely hoping that better standardisation of expectations with regards to training comes out of the survey um, and recommendations and make it to the next version of the um, NMAS. Please share any concerns you have as much as you're able. Thank you, Joanne. Um, yeah, feedback, feedback, feedback. And absolutely, you know, and, and again, we just want to reiterate that although Danielle and I are both mediators, we are also academics, and in this and in this circumstance for the NMAS review, we have that academic hat, but you know, firm on our head. We come into this without an agenda, an agenda, only with curiosity to see what is actually going to come out, because it is your voices who will make um, who will make those recommendations and and those and will we'll make the recommendations, but it's your <laughs> voices that will inform what we say out of that. And some of them, some of it will be surprises to us. Yes. Some of us will be, some of it will be expected um, and you know, evidence of anecdotal practice that we all know is happening. Um, you know, and other bits. Yeah. So we're we're looking mm. forward to sharing that. Um, yeah, I think I just want to say, like, you know, keep your eye, we're we're gonna release another part of part the part for the effectiveness survey. But you know, there were there were things that Emma May and I I found out from the effectiveness survey that we were genuinely surprised about. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we are learning things. And I think that for a lot of people, um, you know, we have particularly people that, um, you know, they're starting out with, and a lot of people having trouble finding work and going, I can't make a living, you know, that sort of thing. What we'll be able to do is to say, because when you're out at your conferences, you're not there going, oh, no, I've got no work here. And, you know, we're, to we, we, we're talking ourselves up and all, all of those sorts of things. So I think what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to say, you know, hey, this is where the work is. These are the kinds of, you know, we'll be able to give people information um, that will allow, you know, allow them to take more control over their choices, about where they had their careers, what their expectations are, all in relation to also what practice looks like. So the potential is, you know, there for us to learn so much. And that's why we don't have an agenda. Like for, for MMA and I, we're like, we can't believe the potent, the things that we might find out. We hope there are things that shock us. But, you know, if we've, we've asked the right questions, if there are things that we just go, oh, weren't, wasn't expecting that at all. So, I, think, I think the thing that I want to say is what I'm excited about for our community is that there is a lot of practice that happens where people go, oh, you can't talk about that, or you know, we should we do we no, 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 we have to be purely facilitative, or we have to be whatever. What we have found out from the effectiveness survey is that's just not a fact. Yeah. Everybody, everybody practices differently, and it's time to celebrate that mm -hmm. rather than you know, rather than the risk of pretending that we're not doing it. And that the what can come out of this survey, um, not this survey, yes, this survey, but what can come out of this review is the fact that it's oh my goodness, conciliators practice this way and there are some similarities with facilitative mediators and so there's this, but there's also some differences that that for the parties that we represent could be important. So let's, yes. let's talk and, and, about that and celebrate it. And, yeah. and the other thing for me too, which is the most exciting thing, is that, well, there's so many exciting things. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's really exciting is that just because you train in a certain way and you start off like that, the expectations of a graduate might not be the same as the expectations of a practicing mediator. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what we're seeing is that people are going, oh, I practice so differently to everybody else. In actual fact, all it is, is that everybody's evolved in a similar way and it seems different because it's not the same in, as in terms of how we were trained. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we'll be able to find out if there are certain patterns in terms of you know, people that are graduates tend to practice like this, but people that have been doing it for 10 years, there's a common thread and they've all shifted in this way. So if we do that, then the standards that we have, we can be clear about, is this the minimum standards for, you know, entry level graduates, or does this actually reflect the way that practice typically grows and it grows and evolves over time so that then people aren't going, oh, I can't be honest or I have to not pretend that I do that. Like there's no point because we can't then learn what works. Mm -hmm. If we, if we're all pretending we're doing this thing and then we're saying this work, you know, if it works in this situation, does the data that we've got there is may not actually be accurate because we might be assuming that people are doing one thing and they're actually doing something else. So it's time for us to be able to really find out what works for people 
in a given context and depending on maybe the, the, um, how sophisticated the practice is. So that, that's the thing that's exciting for me is that we're not all sort of pretending that it's, um, you know, it, it's all the same. We can really start to honour the, the evolution as we develop our skills. Now, again, that's us getting on. <laughs> we're just going to answer the questions. And, and oh, look, I, I think that's a really important message because sometimes people are frightened to answer the truth because they might get in trouble or dumped on or anything like that. So that's that's a really important message for everyone. Just, yes. you know, please, when feel, you answer the survey, please tell us what you're doing. Yeah. So first of all, be assured your answers are de-identified. So, you know, no one's going to, no one's going to dob <laughs> to use an Australianism. But the other thing is if we don't find, if, if people are saying, oh, I should be doing this, that's not what actual practice is. Let's really be clear about what actual practice is. Yeah. So I won't go on. Okay. Jason, when is the date of the survey expected to be compiled and mediators informed of the results? So to analyse um, a survey of this kind, as you, you will understand, requires a lot of um, a lot a lot of quite sophisticated analysis, and the survey itself will actually be informing the recommendations that we make to the MSB and the recommendations of the MS, and then from there the MSB will actually consult and, and release those. So it'll be up to the MSB to release. Um, to release the recommendations that come out of this, which will be happening in, in mid-year. So, so and, I'm, and I'm not sure what their process is going to be. They may wish to, you know, uh, to internalise that with a, with a consultant, and but I'm, we're not sure. That's up to the MSB what they do with the recommendations, but I'm sure they will make the recommendations transparent to the community. Um, you know, we can't make the decisions about that. Okay. Um, and, you know, to, to, be, to be fair, the MSB because this is an independent process, have been wonderful supporters. I mean, they were the ones who engaged us and it was, you know, we, we it wasn't the simplest methodology and it was, a, you know, and we, we were saying this is ambitious and this is a big thing and they have been supporting us independently in, in the background. And we wanted to give a big shout out to the MSB um, yeah, for, for, their, for their commitment to this process because it's, you know, they haven't shied away from the fact that this is going to be challenging. So yeah. it's on them. Okay, um, lots of thank yous and goodbyes. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I think I've reached the end of the questions. Have I missed anything out? Joanne, I'll leave it to you. Leave it to you. Speak now, forever hold your peace, anybody. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we'll let you get back to your, to your day. Again, on behalf of Resolution Resources and the NMAS review team, we wanna say thank you for thank everybody's you. contribution. Um, to the review and the consultation part um, of the review yeah. we can't do it without you no and we can't wait to learn about what you do it's so exciting <laughs> so exciting i feel we feel so privileged yeah. who else gets to learn about what so many practitioners are actually doing it's mind-boggling mind <laughs> about how lucky we are so so um yeah great wonderful opportunity Oh, excellent. Thank you once again for this. And, and um, just a reminder, people, if you haven't checked out the um, NMAS review website, there is some data from the um, previous consultations. That's, that's already very interesting. So this is going to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks yeah. once again. Um, so once the recording's rendered, um, I'll, I'll pop it up and share the link out to everyone who's um, participated Thank you. and distributed uh, widely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Thank everybody, you. for coming. Thank you.